teacher and teacher trainer with over 20 years of experience in the field. He has taught all ages and levels. And, but today, as I understand, he is here not only as a teacher, but as well as a parent. And the problem for me with this particular session one is it's on a Sunday morning, which no human being should really have to talk in any kind of sensible manner on. Um, the second problem is, actually, I have to begin with a kind of confession, because I sort of feel like I'm a bit of an imposter. Um, I feel like I've kind of gate-crashed somebody else's party and that I shouldn't really be here. Because actually, I think probably I should be speaking at a different conference. And the conference I should be speaking at is failing to bring up bilingual children. Um, and I feel a bit weird beginning a day which is going to be all about success stories and teachers sharing all of the great things they're doing because I begin by telling you the disaster of my attempt and my wife's attempt to bring our own two children up speaking the tongues of their father and their mother um, to begin a little bit with my own personal context and the sort of bilingual part of my life. Uh, my wife is originally third generation Chinese Indonesian. Okay? Uh, her mother tongue is Indonesian and she grew up in Jakarta. We met in the 1990s when I was living and working in Jakarta. And when we met, she's seven years younger than me, and when we met, she already spoke really, really good English. She kind of was somewhere around, I don't know, between Cambridge Advanced and Cambridge Proficiency. And I've been living in Indonesia for a couple of years. My spoken Indonesian is pretty decent. I've travelled around a lot. I'm comfortable in the language. I can spend a week without talking English, just talking Indonesian. And when we met, there was this kind of curious feeling of both being able to speak both languages, which was you know, quite a nice sort of feeling. What then happened was, um, quite soon after we met, she left Indonesia and never returned to live there, okay? Um, when she was 19, she went off to study in the States. Uh, she lived in the States for a year, then she ended up in England. I was still living in Indonesia, I went back to England. We met again, and her whole adult life her whole university career, her whole professional life has been through English. And particularly living in the UK, living in London, there's a very, very small Indonesian community. Um, Indonesia is a tropical country. If you're from Indonesia, there are weather-related reasons why England might not be your first choice of country to emigrate to. Uh, a lot of Indonesians emigrate to Australia because it's hot and quite close to Indonesia. But the problem we always had was her English was much, much better than my Indonesian. And sometimes she'd get frustrated and I'd try and talk Indonesian and she'd just say, I'm just going to talk to you in English because it's too difficult to do like this. I think gradually she started to feel like a lot of people who move overseas and become disconnected from their first language kind of community, in a sense that she was losing her kind of first language roots. And particularly, we realised later, she had no L1 experience of talking to children. Um, she'd never had friends who'd had children that she'd spoken to in Indonesian, because she left when she was basically just an adult herself. She didn't have that experience of having, you know, nephew, uh, cousins or nephews or nieces, she didn't have the experience of watching her friends talk to children in Indonesian. And I think also, because of her own kind of family context and background, she didn't have the experience of having been spoken to in a kind of affectionate, sweet way through Indonesian. Um, when she was growing up, her dad came from a very poor background and ended up making money, but he was working like 28 hours a day. Um, it was, you know, you don't need me to tell you these kinds of stories, but it was tough. Uh, and she kind of grew up with her mum under a lot of pressure, her dad under a lot of pressure. There wasn't a lot of kind of, you know, sweet family talk around the dinner table. There was much more kind of do your homework, clean your room, get everything organised. We have to kind of, 
you know, stay alive and stay afloat. The next thing that I think happened was we had kids quite late. So we'd never really planned to have kids or discussed having kids. Um, personally, I've never thought about having kids all through my life. I seem to be quite happy not having kids. And I got to the age of 38, 39 without having any children, as far as I know. Uh, and when I got to sort of 38, 39, my wife suddenly woke up one morning and said, I'd like to have a kid. So, whoa, 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 this was never part of the deal. Well, what do you mean you'd like to have a kid? How badly do you want one? If you don't want to have one with me, I'll find someone else. Woo! Okay, how about a holiday and said, no, has to be a kid. Okay, so we started trying for children. And in the end, after a long, complicated kind of couple of years, um, she finally got pregnant and we had a lovely baby daughter called Maya. And when Maya was born, she was big. I mean, she was, she was enormous. She was like a kind of vast human potato. <laughs> and it was a very difficult birth. Um, my wife was in labour for about 18 hours. She lost a lot of blood. There were like 12 people in the room. Um, it was like a scene from some kind of cheap horror movie by the end of it. And the next two or three years were really difficult. Um, because it was a difficult birth, she was a very difficult baby. Uh, she slept very badly. About three years, I would have said, of the two of us going completely out of our minds with sleep deprivation. Those kind of whispered arguments that you have when you're young parents or new parents. It's your turn to get out of bed. Why are you shouting at me? I'm not shouting. I'm whispering shouting. <laughs> you know, those kind of arguments that you'd start to have. And because I think we were so shocked and exhausted, we're both working. Um, she runs her own business. I was teaching and writing and travelling. And we spent three years basically slightly insane through sleep deprivation. And during all of this time, there really was no plan for bringing up a baby bilingually. Um, the basic plan was, how the hell do we get through today? You know, when will we ever be able to sleep? And eventually, I think, we sort of thought maybe we should try and teach her Indonesian. You know, that's what bi-national, bilingual couples are supposed to do, isn't it? And initially, my wife read a couple of books and said, OK, what seems to be necessary is one of us seems to need to talk Indonesian to her all the time. I guess that should probably be me. And she tried this for a couple of weeks. And she kept stopping and talking English. And she'd say, I don't know how to say that in Indonesian. I've never heard anybody have this conversation in Indonesian. I, I left when I was 19. I've never spoken to babies in my own first time. I don't know. It's too much you do it. Well, me, you want me to be the Indonesian speaker all the time. Well, how's that going to work? You just try and do it. So I tried for a couple of weeks and it destroyed my brain because not only was I now sleep deprived, but I was sleep deprived in a foreign language. And I think what we then decided was, okay, that's not going to work. Maybe what we should do is just try one hour a day. So bath time became Indo hour. And we would both just speak Indonesian while she was having a bath. And we would play little kind of games. We'd kind of go, you know, di mana kuping maya. Ah, di zini kuping maya. Di mana hidung maya. Iya, di zini hidung maya. Di mana run for maya. You know, we'd do these kind of little things like this. And this started to work, even though as a non-native speaker of Indonesian, I suffered from this kind of non-native guilt or anxiety about being a non-native speaker. You know, am I teaching her my own bad Indonesian? Will I somehow sort of damage her and, and stop her being able to learn better Indonesian? Eventually, it sort of started going quite well. By the time she was three, she knew a lot of Indonesian words, um, we'd sort of ask and answer and have little conversations in Indonesian. And then she started going to the childminder. And once she started going to the childminder, this weird thing happened where the world of home and using Indonesian 
collided with the outside world when no one understood Indonesian. And quite quickly, she got frustrated with it. And the childminder would say, yes, yeah, she keeps asking for susu, and I've no idea what she's talking about. She says, maya mau susu. Yeah, she wants some milk. Oh, what language is that then? It's Indonesian. She's speaking to yeah, it's a long story, complicated. Um, and Maya sort of realized, well, Tanika doesn't understand me. It's like, yeah, Tanika doesn't speak Indonesian. Who else understands me? Basically, no one else that you're going to meet out there in the big wide world. And something inside her kind of shut down, I think. And she stopped answering questions in Indonesian and she'd started ask, answering them in English. And she'd still understand when I asked her questions in Indonesian, but she would just say, Dimana could be my, these are my ears, daddy. You know, this kind of thing. And it was quite a strange sort of transition where we felt she's kind of kicking back and rejecting it. My wife, because of our own personal history, is incredibly pragmatic about this. My wife's parents, her father speaks a Chinese dialect called Ket as his first tongue, and he speaks Indonesian as his second language. My mother, her mother, grew up speaking Kut and Indonesian bilingually. Until my wife was five, her main tongue was Kut, because this was the home language. When she was five, she started school. And at this time in Indonesia, if you were Chinese Indonesian, you weren't allowed to print Chinese, you weren't allowed to teach Chinese in language schools, you weren't allowed to join the military, and you weren't allowed in politics. So lots of Chinese Indonesians became business people, you know, they were kind of like the Jews of Asia in this respect, um, trying to work out how they could do business in a situation that made life difficult for them. And her father was very pragmatic about it. When she got to five and started school, her father said, listen, you're growing up in Indonesia, you're basically Indonesian, if you need kurt, you can learn it later. And this happened with all of her, her brothers and sisters. And, of course, she didn't need kurt later, apart from trying to understand her parents. Now, she understands a few little bits and pieces, but basically has lost her Chinese. Her first language is Indonesian, her second language is English. And I think because of this, she became very pragmatic and said, well, of course they're not going to learn Indonesian, they're growing up in London. Yeah, first language English, probably they'll want something sensible like Spanish for their second language. That's what they'll probably learn at school. It's more useful, you can go to more countries. And she was, in a way, just very, doesn't matter, people change languages. My family's changed languages, they'll change languages, maybe they'll have kids who learn something different for a different reason. But, I think if you're a binational couple, particularly somewhere like the UK, there's a kind of binational couple language sharing failure shaming. And what often happens is you have this conversation where people say, oh, your wife's from Indonesia, oh, are you bringing your children up bilingually? You must be, it must be great for your children to have two languages. No. Oh, oh, okay, failure. You know, it's almost like you have this conversation where you can feel people kind of going, loser. And there's this very strong sense of, you know, you've betrayed your children. You've not shared your heritage with them. And it's like, they still eat Indonesian food, they still go to Indonesia, they've still got that Indonesian connection, but you try and do it, my friend. And so we had this kind of feeling like this. We both also had feelings of guilt, I think. But the great advantage we still have is when our kids are really annoying us and we're both thinking about killing them, we can now discuss it without them being able to understand what we're talking about. So we can sit there at the breakfast table while my son is throwing himself on the floor and we can say, Oh, don't And the children know we're talking about them and say, God, what's the matter with him this time? I'm ready to kill him. And we manage to sort out what we're going to do about it. We have that conversation without the kids knowing what it is we're talking about. So, you know, there's a silver lining to this particular cloud, okay? When I think about where it went wrong, I look at my co-author, Andrew. Andrew's uh, English, he speaks fluent Spanish, he's married to a woman from Valencia, and their children are both fully functionally bilingual, 
And I think what's different is, when his kids were growing up, they both spoke Spanish most of the time, and his wife spoke Spanish all the time only, okay, with the children. They were both very persistent. When they started to get resistance, and the children started stop, not answering in Spanish, but answering in English, they just carried on. They didn't give up at the first kind of setback, like we did. We just sort of went, she doesn't want to learn it, let's move on, we're too exhausted to try and fight it. I think also what's different is, in London there's a big Spanish speaking community. So Andrew's children at school had friends who originally had Colombian backgrounds or Argentinian backgrounds or Venezuelan backgrounds. In the playground there was a little group of kids who would speak Spanish and English and mix the languages up. My kids don't have that. You know, there are no other Chinese, Indonesian, white, English mixed kids as far as we know, you know, anywhere in North London that we've encountered. So I think this is a big advantage. Um, Andrew's kids travelled backwards and forwards. Spain's much closer. They had that kind of linguistic connection with the family and with Spanish-speaking communities in London. Later, they went and spent two years and did high school in Spain. And, you know, his daughter, Rebecca, is now doing translation work. My feeling now is, I've got to the stage where my daughter's nine and my son's six, and I still feel, partly, they can pick it up later if they really want to. If my daughter wants to go and spend a year in Indonesia after school or after university, she can. She can volunteer, she can work there. She'll learn it while she's there if she wants to, or not. But, as she's hit nine, she suddenly started asking, can I learn a bit more Indonesian? And so suddenly, after a kind of four or five year gap, we're back on the flashcards, we're sitting there doing flashcards. Sometimes we do the kind of old baby thing, I'm not a baby anymore, daddy. Oh, yeah, you can still remember where your hidung is, though. And we have this little thing where I'll still ask questions in Indonesian. Basic things, sometimes it's just things like, Kenapa, which she knows means why. Yeah, kapan, when. So she can do these kind of basic things and she can answer in English. And I still sing bedtime songs to the kids. And one of the songs I always sing is in Indonesian, called Bintang Kecil. And they both love doing it and love hearing it. And Maya always says, you know, it reminds me of my granny and granddad on my mum's side. Even though they've never sung it for her. But it's just connected to that side of her life. And I think in the end for me, what I came to feel was, you just keep it on the menu. Okay? They may not order it, they may not have the whole three course meal. But as a parent, I want to at least feel it's available on the menu for them to choose from as they're going through their life. And that is the story of my semi-failed attempt to raise my bilingual children. Thank you. so sort of just burned out and I was in the middle of getting made redundant from university, we moved houses, all this other stuff happening in life. Um, we didn't try it in anything like the same way. My son also had a much more complicated relationship with English than my daughter did. My daughter learned English very naturally and was reading very, very young. My son had his own kind of weird internal grammar for about two years. So he would do things like, instead of saying, we went there, he would say, we did go there. And being a teacher, I'd sort of go, I know, we went there last week. I oh, know, Daddy, I did say that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and you try and explain it. It's like, I, I, I know, I know, I know. And then eventually, after about a year, he started saying, we did went there, Daddy. <laughs> oh, something's changing. And then, you know, finally, after two years of me rephrasing and giving it back to him and reformulating, he suddenly started saying, we went there last week, we saw the lion. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So I think with my son, 
just trying to get him into English was much more complicated, actually. There's some sort of weird analytical machine going on with him. My daughter just kind of listened, copied, listened, copied. She was very literate, very young. My son started reading later. It was harder to get him to read. He was very resistant to learning to read in English. So then the idea on top of that of saying, oh, and let's do another language as well, just killed me. You know, there's no way we, we were in a position to just physically, emotionally, energetically, we didn't have that to give him. So, no. But in the same way, he, he does do the flashcards and he does understand the questions. So, there are little bits ticking away in his head. You know, little bits. Yeah? But my daughter has started sort of saying, I speak Indonesian at school. And I keep, don't tell people that. You don't speak Indonesian. You know, there are kids in your school who really do speak Turkish bilingually or, or Somali bilingually or French bilingually. You do not speak Indonesian. You understand a little bit of Indonesian. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, no, but it's, it's, it's floating in there, yeah, but no, we were, we were less rigorous in that sense. And I think because we had that experience of being knocked back by my daughter, we just kind of felt like, oh, what's the point, he's only going to reject it later anyway. Yeah. Anything else anyone wanted to ask? Hey. Uh, uh, when did your daughter start to say, I went there? Again? Not, uh, we went there, not we did go there. When did your daughter start to say that? Uh, uh, she was about four. Four. But by the time she was about four, she was using basically grammatically correct English. Okay. My son took him to when he was just about six. I mean, you know, boys, slow learners. <laughs> Good girls, much smarter. You know, I'm, you know, my wife keeps telling me this. You know, How come you're seven years older than me? But more stupid, yeah, I know. I don't know. I'm a slow learner. Yeah. Anything else anyone wanted to ask? Do you sing that song? Yeah. <laughs> My voice is destroyed from talking all week. Let's see how we go. In tanke chill, di langit yang biru, amatanya mungi asi angkasa. Aku ingin terbang dan belayang jauh tinggi. Ketumpet yang berada. <laughs>